is it really okay for me to quit? I asked my boss in front of me, seeking confirmation. Rather, I want you to quit as soon as possible, especially now when the severance pay we owe you is minimal. My younger female boss responded, adding insult to injury. Her words led me to head home. After this, the company is going to face serious trouble. Little did my female boss know what was coming. My name is Thomas Richardson, 55 years old. After my divorce, I joined this company as a mid-career hire and have been working here for 30 years. I'm approaching retirement with less than five years left, but I'm still considered a sidelined employee. I haven't seen my child in over 30 years. My ex-wife didn't want us to meet. There was a dispute at the time, but now I've come to terms with it. As a parent, I only wanted to fulfill my duty of paying child support, which ended when my child became an adult. I don't have any plans to spend money on anything special now. I've never had a desire for promotion, so I'm grateful for my current work environment where I can take things easy. My hobbies are fishing and golf. I often go alone on my days off, but I've made friends and had various conversations with people I meet there. One of these friends owns a boat and sometimes takes me out to sea, and another, a farmer, shares homegrown vegetables with me. I don't have a family, but I don't feel lonely, thanks to these expanding social connections. I really enjoy living my days at my own pace. One day, I arrived at the office to find everyone in a frenzy. What's going on? I asked Mark, a junior colleague sitting next to me. It turns out, there's a sudden inspection from the headquarters. Ah, oh, that's where everyone's suddenly cleaning up. They should just show it as it is. I said with a laugh and sat down to start my work. We've had such inspections before, but they never really posed a problem. The employees hurrying to tidy up were the ones who didn't keep their desks organized regularly. If they had just done the bare minimum of tidying every day, they wouldn't be panicking like this now. I've only understood the importance of daily tidying at my age, so I can't say much. A few hours later, the inspectors from the headquarters arrived. The person in charge of our department was a young woman. However, it seems she holds the position of a manager. Watching her greet us, I assumed she must be quite capable. Hello, I'm Jessica from the headquarters. Today, I'm here to observe your work. Please continue with your usual tasks. We nodded in response to her greeting and began our usual work. She's beautiful. Some of the younger male employees seemed a bit excited by her presence, which made me chuckle at their youthfulness. What does this mean? Jessica was asking questions and smiling as she inspected each employee's work. Then, she came to me. Um, what is that part-timer doing right now? Her question was directed at me. Uh, I'm a full-time employee, I said with a forced smile. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you a supervisor? Jessica apologized. No, no, I'm just a regular employee without a title. Well, about my current work, I was about to explain when her tone changed abruptly. What? Jessica's voice took on a sharp edge. I looked up at her voice. A regular employee, at your age. Her words were cutting. She seemed angry, and I felt intimidated. Uh, yes, I've never been much interested in climbing the corporate ladder. I stumbled over my words, and she burst out laughing. Isn't it simply because you can't do the job? Incompetent and old, you're fired as of today. Don't bother coming in tomorrow, she said harshly. Not just me, but the surrounding employees were stunned by her words. We can afford to pay incompetent people. This is necessary for the company's cost-cutting. There are plenty of others who can replace you. Realizing I was being insulted, I clenched my fist in anger. Sure, she might be competent, but that doesn't give her the right to belittle others. Annoyed, I stood up and said to her, Is it really okay for me to quit? 
I ask Jessica for confirmation. Rather, I'd prefer you quit now while we can still save on severance pay. She insulted me further with a satisfied smile. I no longer felt like working. I had been told to leave. It wouldn't be marked as an absence. I picked up my bag and left the company. As I left the department, everyone tried to stop me, but nobody dared speak in front of Jessica. My direct boss, Samuel, had more authority than Jessica, but there's a tradition in our company of not opposing headquarters staff. Samuel said nothing, and I walked home alone. The next day was Saturday, and the company was already closed. Wondering what to do for Monday, I decided not to waste the holiday worrying and went fishing instead. I'd think things through while doing something I enjoy. Fishing is the perfect hobby for that. I went fishing early in the morning. It was my usual, favorite fishing spot. Despite my mood, the sea was calm, promising a good night with good fish. With that thought, I cast my line. Hey, I thought you might be here. Someone called out to me. Max. It was my fishing buddy, Max Stewart. We met here. He's 10 years older than me, but a dear friend who looks after me and listens to my stories. Any luck today? This is good, so I hoped for a big catch, but it's not going as expected, I said, opening my box. Only one fish so far. Max laughed at that. Well, no rush, he said, setting up his gear a little away from me. Clouds drifted slowly by. Even though the fishing scenery was the same as always, my mood was notably heavier, probably due to what happened yesterday. What's wrong? You look down today, Max said. I laughed at his words. Max, I have something I need to apologize to you for. What do you mean? Then, I began to speak slowly. Actually, there was an inspection from the headquarters last Friday. I met a manager there for the first time, and it seems she took a dislike to me, I said, laughing to hide my embarrassment. I was told not to come back. I got angry and left. I might end up getting fired. I've shared so much with you, and you've encouraged me. I'm sorry. No need to apologize to me, Max said, then silently stared at his float in the sea, occasionally sighing deeply as if pondering something. I'd rather live a relaxed life than get busy with promotions. But it seems that hard-working youngsters don't like that. Relationships are harder than work, aren't they? I said earnestly, and Max replied. Well, I can understand the supervisor's feelings, but it's wrong to unjustly fire someone. A supervisor should understand their subordinates' feelings and situations. That's what she lacks. People who climb the ladder just based on their brains or performance often misunderstand things. I admired Max's wisdom. He got angry for me and cared about my situation. Talking to him made me feel much better. Just talking to someone can make such a difference. I thanked Max and shifted my mood. After that, I caught more fish than ever. Perhaps the fish didn't want to come near me with my dark aura. While thinking this, I returned home with a heavy cooler box. Two days later, on Monday. Despite it being a work day, I stayed at home. I had been pushed out in such a manner, I wasn't sure whether to go back. Max, whom I met on Saturday, gave me advice. The company is all about people. You don't need to apologize to them. Wait until they come to you. You've been working hard and must have a lot of paid leave, right? Indeed, I never used my paid leave, so I must have a few days worth. Maybe it's a good time for a trip. While thinking this, enjoying a leisurely morning coffee on a weekday felt novel. As I was about to have a late breakfast, my phone rang. It was a call. It was the ringtone of a phone call. When I looked at the screen, it displayed the name of the company I work for, along with the name of my department. What could it be? I had informed Samuel about using my leave. 
Hello. As soon as I answered, I heard Samuel's frantic voice. Thomas, come to the office right away. Why? I told you I'm using my leave. I replied. But Samuel insisted. Please, just come. We're in big trouble. Our biggest client says they'll cancel all contracts if you're fired. Please come and help continue the contract. I laughed cynically. Why should I go and beg? You saw the exchange the other day, right? Jessica told me I'm fired to go home. If she doesn't admit her fault and apologize by the time my leave is used up, then I'll have nothing to do with the company anymore. So, I don't care about future contracts. I said, sipping my coffee. Don't say that. I know how hard you've worked. That should be enough. It's nice of you to say so. But whether Jessica is a headquarters supervisor and I'm a low-level employee, it doesn't give her the right to be rude. You understand that, right Samuel? Please, consider the future in the company. I said and hung up the phone. I had somewhat anticipated this development. But for Jessica, it must have been like a bolt from the blue. I might have caused trouble for everyone at the branch. However, Max's words, don't apologize to the company, stuck with me. And then, in the evening of that day, I received a call from the headquarters on my cell phone. It was probably her. Expecting to be insulted again. I cleared my throat and answered the call. Hello, hello, this is Jessica from the headquarters. Is this Thomas's phone? Yes, it is. What do you want? I replied coldly, and she spoke with a lord voice. I'm truly sorry for the disrespectful things I said the other day. I would like to apologize personally, which is why I'm calling you. Her voice lacked the confidence and assertiveness from before. Perhaps her behavior during the inspection had been reported to the headquarters and she had been reprimanded by her superiors. Understood. I thought it wouldn't hurt to at least hear her out. She suggested meeting at a restaurant our company frequently uses for clients and wanted to meet that evening. I was on leave and agreed to meet her that night. I arrived at the restaurant first. I never thought we'd be having a meal together, but probably. She was instructed to apologize to me to salvage the major contract. I could sense the desperation of the company. I'm sorry for being late, Jessica said as she entered the room. We sat down across from each other. I'm sorry for calling you out like this today. She seemed on the verge of tears. Feeling a bit sorry for her, I smiled and said, Your feelings have already come across, Jessica. I came here today to forgive you, but your view is too biased. I'm not in a position to preach, but I wanted to have a talk. Encouraged by my words, she started to speak. Actually, I was raised in a single parent family by a strict mother. She believed that since we were already at a disadvantage, I had to beat others, regardless of gender, in academics and attitude. She insisted that I should study hard, join a reputable company, and climb the corporate ladder. I also believed that approach was necessary to survive in society. She spoke without touching her food. I replied, That's true. It's not wrong and is actually a wonderful approach. Thank you, she said, and I smiled at her. Jessica, slightly reassured, continued. So, I thought, I'm working this hard, and maybe unknowingly pushed that onto others. And I got targeted because, even at my age, I hadn't climbed the ranks. I laughed, understanding her point, and she shrank a bit with guilt. I had no intention of blaming her anymore. She must have been trying her best in her own way. Then, seeing her still hesitant, I encouraged her to eat. She was probably hungry after a long day. We both picked up our chopsticks together. I mused that it had been a while since I had a meal with someone. But while I was feeling relaxed, she still seemed a bit down. Well, a company doesn't run just on its superiors. You're still young. It's good that you realize this now. I smiled, trying to encourage her. 
Finally, Jessica seemed to truly relax. Thank you, she said to me and then started eating. Her mother must have been desperate to raise her well. She seemed like a well-disciplined lady. After that, we engaged in casual conversation. I, who had not attended university, listened to her stories about her college days and about the situation at the headquarters. The ice was broken, and we enjoyed our meal together. During our conversation, she asked me a question. By the way, why did Mr. Stewart, the president of our main contractor, say he would cancel the contract if you weren't there? I laughed. I, Max, and I are fishing buddies. We met by chance and became good friends. I talked earnestly about work, and that's why they contracted with us. Of course, it's not just because we're friends. He was convinced by my proposal. She was surprised. To think you secured such a major contract. Then she fell silent. I understood what she wanted to say. She was probably wondering why I hadn't climbed a corporate ladder despite securing such a major contract. I really had no desire for promotion. I said with a smile, and she smiled back. Well, there are others in charge of Max's company, but he often contacts me directly. He knew I was sincere, so he trusted me as a business partner, and we've had a good relationship. That's how it was. You've been supporting the company as a hidden pillar, and I was just. Don't worry about it anymore. She wasn't a bad person. Being in a managerial position at a rage at our company meant she must have worked very hard. Jessica seemed to be reflecting on her actions, feeling ashamed for only seeing the surface and results. If you've reflected, just keep working hard from now on. I'm already 55, close to retirement, and don't have a family. So I don't plan to pursue promotions, but I think your approach is not wrong. Good luck. I encouraged her again. Then, Jessica looked up. No family, right? I don't have anything to protect, so I plan to live a carefree life from now on. She smiled gently in response to my smile. Hearing about my way of living, she probably thought to herself that such a life is also possible. I decided to work hard so that she and the younger employees could thrive in the company even after my retirement. I returned to work, cutting my leave short. My colleagues in the department were relieved to see me back. When they started to speak ill of Jessica, I said, I've made peace with her. I've heard her reasons. She's a colleague in the company. Let's stop attacking her. I was thankful they stood up for me, but bad-mouthing only breeds more negativity. Everyone agreed with my words. And so, I was able to return to my original environment and gratefully resume my work. A few months later, while enjoying my usual routine at work and fishing with Max and other friends on my days off, I heard a rumor amidst these peaceful days. Jessica is said to have faked her performance for promotion and is going to face a disciplinary meeting. I was surprised. Facing a disciplinary meeting. This could mean demotion, a pay cut, or, in the worst case, a disciplinary action. I couldn't believe Jessica would do such things. We really talked a lot that day. Her face, as she spoke about her efforts and the challenges she faced in her work, showed no signs of deceit. Of course, if she truly did wrong, she should be punished and reflect. But if it was a false accusation, it would be too unfair. If there was even a slight chance of a wrongful accusation, I wanted to help clear her name. After what happened, I couldn't see her as a stranger anymore. Of course, anything I could investigate, the HR department had already looked into. But still, I reviewed the documents she created and the records of transactions I heard about. Among them were documents from companies where my golf friends are managers or executives. I reached out and spoke to various people, confirming there was no wrongdoing in her dealings. Furthermore, everyone unanimously said, Jessica really worked hard for us. Then, I advised this to HR. The HR manager, Tyler, 
is my contemporary. Though he's younger than me since I was hired mid-career, we've known each other for a long time. If Thomas says so, it must be right. He believed my words. Later, I found out that the source of the rumor was the work of her older subordinates who were jealous of Jessica. I was dismayed to realize that there are petty people everywhere. Those individuals apparently faced disciplinary action. A few days later, Jessica came back to our department. Thomas, can I talk to you for a moment? She asked. Nervously, I followed her into a separate room. She said, Thank you for the other day. I heard from Tyler that you helped clear my name. I really appreciate it. Then, she expressed her gratitude. I responded, It's nothing. I couldn't believe that you would do such a thing. It was just a little talk since Tyler happened to be my contemporary. I said this with a laugh, even though my heart was racing. But I had something I needed to say. Can I tell you something? I asked Jessica. She tilted her head curiously. Actually, I went through various documents you prepared. That's when I first learned your family name. I looked down. In fact, I was too nervous to look up. A, hey, oh, my family name. It's Harford, Jessica said. I gathered my courage and spoke what I needed to say. Actually, my ex-wife's maiden name was Harford, and our daughter, who we've been separated from since she was two, is named Jessica. What? She exclaimed, her eyes widening in shock. I finally looked up, scratching my head. I thought it must be a coincidence, but just in case. She filled her eyes with tears and stared at me intently. I waited for her words. Thomas Richardson is my father's name. I learned it when I saw my mom's diary, and at her words, I was astounded. It's me, I murmured naturally, almost without thinking. Tears embarrassingly began to fall from my eyes. Hearing my words, Jessica cried out like a child and clung tightly to me. I hesitantly wrapped my arms around her. The last time I held her was when she was two. Realizing how much she had grown, I was moved again by her struggles. Is your mother well? I asked, and she nodded happily. I was grateful to my ex-wife for raising her so well. I never imagined reuniting like this. I thought I had no family left, yet she was so close all along. My encounters and earnest efforts had finally paid off for my daughter. I realized anew the importance of trust in relationships. Hard work eventually pays off, becoming a tool to help oneself and loved ones in unexpected ways. And then there's me with no desire for promotion and my daughter with her high aspirations. Though our thoughts differ, our sincerity in wanting the best for the company is undeniable. That's why we should continue living honestly according to our beliefs. I want to live a relaxed life, but will work diligently until retirement to leave some savings for my daughter. I'll respect her wishes and fully support her desire to succeed. That way, we both will surely find happiness 